anti-libertarian <clears throat> way to go. Are we live? Yeah. We're recording. Yeah, you can't put that in the podcast. <laughs> I can put anything in the podcast <clears throat> I want. No, to. you can't. Yes, I can. It's my po- well. It's my podcast. I, I didn't RHB. sign anything. Okay. My editor said we shouldn't talk over each other, mm-hmm. so we should do that the whole time. Okay. But David, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Do you want me to call you the Reverend Doctor Professor Emeritus? No. no, you may call me David. Great, thanks. Mm-hmm. So, why are you emeritus? Uh, because my position at Calvin College concluded in June of 2021. And uh, they granted me emeritus status so that I could still have certain privileges vis-a-vis the campus. Okay. And you're here in Grand Rapids pastoring a church now. That's correct. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. Started started early. Was was there something about the way that you grew up that predisposed you to be a language guy? I don't think so. No, No. Uh, I was born at a very young age, uh, like most of us. Mm -hmm. And um, my high school experience was pretty, um, I would say, average on the whole. The only uh, courses that I took in high school that were really stimulating were the science and mathematics courses. I went to a very small rural high school. I had some excellent teachers, uh, but there were very few offerings in languages and literature. And so I went to Calvin College as an undergraduate thinking that I would study mathematics or physics or computer science or something like that. And um, I had a philosophy course with a really exceptional instructor, a man named John Hare, who was an expert in Immanuel Kant and um, also read classics at Balliol in Oxford. And uh, I didn't do real well in his class, but I was fascinated and highly stimulated by uh, his philosophy teaching. Hmm. So I quickly... um, jettisoned my plans for something in the STEM disciplines and began uh, pursuing philosophy. Interesting. So your exposure to this professor Mm -hmm. and his classes, and I would probably assume the readings you were actually doing, right? even though, as you say, you didn't do exceptional in the class. Mm -hmm. B minus. Okay. But good enough to feel like you had gained a little bit of competency and uh, I don't know if I felt I had gained any competency. I had gained a great deal of interest. Okay. Uh, so this individual... This was um, your freshman year? Yes, this is my very first okay. semester. Okay. And um, this individual had a, a, a very old-fashioned way of doing things mm-hmm. uh, along the British system, as I understood it. So he lined us up in the classroom alphabetically. And I can still tell you who sat in front of me alphabetically and who sat behind me. And he gave us, uh, you know, reading assignments. We had to write answers to various questions based on the texts. And then he would simply go desk by desk, call on us by our last name. Uh, Miss Kitridge, she sat in front of me. Mr. Noe, um, what is your answer to this question? And so then you were on the spot to answer that question. And he was a very gracious individual and brilliant. And so uh, I saw, maybe for the first time, um, some of the contours of the life of the mind. Mm. And I was really attracted to that. Mm. I still didn't do very well academically, but I began to work much harder uh, in a way I hadn't had to before in high school because having some measure of natural ability, I could meet other people's expectations without very much effort. Mm-hmm. And that was not good for me. You know, right. That inculcated laziness, uh, which took time um, to get worked out. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's... That resonates with me because in my high school experience, Mm -hmm. I was quite lazy, Mm -hmm. at least in the first two and a half years. In the remaining year and a half, I I found a goal. Mm -hmm. And I went from getting C's, C minuses, to, you know, A plus pluses. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can take honors courses. And anyway, they gave A pluses at your high school? Yeah, it was very elite. Hmm. Hmm. No, it was also a rural high school. Right. Probably like yours. Um, but they, it was, what was interesting is that because I, I found this goal, mm-hmm. um, my teachers became very supportive of mm-hmm. my efforts. Now, they didn't just hand out A's for free. They right. still made me work for it. But they saw that I I had something I really wanted, Mm -hmm. and they wanted to help me. So um, it sounds like that's 
sort of what happened with you. Like, explain more the the change that happened at Calvin, right? Um, around this course, were you seeing an improvement in your other courses as well, or was it kind of, or was it actually the opposite, where you're like, I don't care at all about STEM, I'm so focused on this new thing, mm-hmm. and this is this is all I care about now. Well, I I, I exited my STEM classes and began taking all humanities types courses. So I declared a major in philosophy, and I began studying uh, the, you know, the history of philosophy part one, which I think the course number was two fifty one or something like that, which goes from pre-Socratics to Aquinas, basically. Mm-hmm. And then after that, you have Aquinas uh, to modernity and the the uh, corresponding course. And I was taking courses in psychology and religion, and um, at the time I was thinking I would go to seminary, so I enrolled in a Greek course. And um, I had a similar experience in the Greek course as I had in the philosophy class, which is having been a, a B minus to B plus student across the board up to that point, at least in college, um, I started to do quite well in Greek, and this was unexpected. And um, as I tell this story, I've told it a few times, a few places, uh, when someone that you admire puts uh, trust in you, as my professors began to do, it really um, accelerated my confidence. Mm. And confidence leads typically to more success, and you know it's a reinforcing kind of cycle. So you work harder, you achieve a little more, and that motivates you to work harder, so you achieve a little more. And so that was hap- that's what was happening at the time. So what was it? What was it then about that course in particular? But then also thereafter, mm-hmm. let's say the the courses you took subsequent to that, once right. you declared a new major. Mm-hmm. What was it about philosophy? that grabbed you. Right, the rigor, um, the clarity, the precision. Uh, so I think that... Well, sorry, but couldn't sure. you get that also in, in the STEM? I'm sure fields? I could, uh, but like I decided I didn't, I didn't want to study those things anymore. Yeah. Though no doubt the, the good instruction I had received in high school from a number of teachers, uh, Byron Davey is one name uh, that I would mention. He was my uh, chemistry and physics teacher in high school. He had an obvious rigor in his approach to problems, and that was inspiring. Uh, In philosophy, I liked the uh, abstract nature of it, Mm. and I've always liked to read, and so here was an opportunity to read a lot in philosophy. And that rigor and that precision, the persistence, uh, those things were very appealing. And I encountered Plato for the first time, you know, with whom I was uh, enchanted. But how do rigor... Mm-hmm. How does rigor and abstract go together? Because mm-hmm. you just you said right. you just enjoyed the abstract nature of philosophy, and yet there was a rigor there that appealed to your personality, your mm-hmm. character. Right. How how does philosophy blend those two? That's a very um, difficult question. I guess I would say if you begin with a belief in objective truth, which I do, and which my professors did as well, that is that there is a God who reveals to Uh, the world, things about himself that are true. And um, in general revelation or the created order, the first book, you might say, uh, we see things through a glass dimly, as Paul says. We don't see with the same clarity and precision as uh, through his inscripturated will in his revealed word. Nevertheless, there is an objective truth to be discovered. And philosophy is a very useful tool to getting at some of that objective truth in a rigorous way, but it's all abstract, right? You can't measure things like the quantity of the soul. You can't measure with a ruler or a calculator um, conditions of truth and so forth. But I was persuaded that uh, these things are nevertheless real and they can and should be investigated. Mm. And this is what um, my my professors instilled in me, Mm -hmm. just a strong belief in the truth and a desire to find out what it is which requires rigor. You can't be sloppy. And I would assume that that's why the languages became so important to you is because, oh, now I'm removing one partition, as it were, Mm -hmm. from my, from access to philosophy. Correct. Right. So I stumbled backward into the study of Greek and Latin. Um, While I was an undergraduate at Calvin, uh, there was an individual there, uh, Chaplain Dale Cooper, who invited me to be a part of a group called Nil Nisi Verum, Nothing Except the Truth. And this was a a group of 12 men, uh, three from each grade level. And we met once per week on a Tuesday evening 
in uh, what is now the president's mansion at Calvin, but was then called the Manor House. It's an old farmhouse that existed on the original Knollcrest campus. And so we met in the basement of that building, and we read through Calvin's Institutes under his guidance. And so we would read a 10 to 15 page selection for each Tuesday. And the idea is if you, be, if you came in as a freshman, in four years you would finish have, uh, having read the entire Institutes. And so as I began to develop strong interest in Reformed theology, uh, the footnotes of the um, Ford Battles and John McNeil edition, the footnotes are filled with references to the Church Fathers, classical authors, and so forth. And it was very frustrating to me that the Greek and Latin of those footnotes uh, was closed off. Mm. And so I began to realize that if I want to know these things in the best possible way, um, as much as you know, I, I can, given my own limitations, I need to know these languages. So I slowly began pushing further back in terms of my um, intellectual interests and eventually just went right to the beginning of uh, Western Civ with Greek and Latin. Mm -hmm. What was the feeling like for you to begin reading these philosophical texts um, and then, of course, the reform texts that, mm -hmm. as we can get into, are built so so much upon mm -hmm. the Greek and Roman philosophy. Right. Um, what was it like for you when you first, do you remember when you first kind of the light went off, you're like, I can actually read mm -hmm. these, the way that they were written? Um, well, I'm still working on that, right? I still have a vastly inferior education to the majority of men of the 16th century. Mm. So I'm still seeking uh, to catch a glimpse of some of their brilliance. And I would like to talk more about what made those men so special. Um, but I'm still in the process of trying to approximate something of their education so that I can appreciate what they were reading uh, in a way that they did, right? Well, let's talk about their education then. What, okay. What's the, what would be, the, if you were to stand side by side with, mm -hmm. I mean, pick someone. Yeah, Theodore Beza. Okay, so you and Beza are sitting here, mm -hmm. and you start to have a conversation. He describes his educational background, <laughs> and you describe yours in terms of the languages we're talking about. Right. Well, I guess we could say also exposure sure. to philosophy and right. whatnot. What would be the differences? And what right. are, I guess what I'm getting at is what are we missing today? Yes. Well, I think that Beza is a gracious man. You know, he lives in glory. I believe he is a gracious man, so I don't think that he would laugh at me for too long. Uh, but I think that he would uh, begin with a deep chuckle. You're a pastor, you're, you're a theologian, or, or you have pretense to translating works and talking about these things. He would be appalled, I think, uh, because um, his education right, began when he was eight or nine years old, and it was very focused, right? Now, men like Beza and Calvin were geniuses in one sense. They were the, you know, the top 1% of every one of their time. Nevertheless, uh, the reason that such men could achieve such heights of learning is because the base was very wide. Anybody who wanted to serve in the church or the academy had a very strict and um, well laid out path of instruction. And it began with five or six years of studying only Latin. And uh, they were required to speak Latin, to write Latin. And if they were to speak a vulgar language, you know, their native tongue, uh, in the confines of the schoolroom, they were shamed and corporally disciplined often. From what age is this? Nine, ten years old. And so they did that, sometimes younger, Franciscus so Junius. Fourth grade? Yes, started when he was six or seven uh, because he had a father who could teach him. Mm -hmm. But if your father wasn't capable in these things, you had to hire someone, which was uh, common. And so that's all you studied for the first six or seven years. Um, then you would go on to study Greek, and you would study Aristotle's um, organon. You would learn logic. You would also dabble in mathematics and astronomy and so forth. And um, that kind of philological training, rigorous training in the languages, builds a capacious memory and a kind of precision uh, that is hard to get any other way. Mm. And so I think Beza would be genuinely surprised um, that, uh, you know, ministers and theologians have, now here I'm casting aspersions, you might say, but I'm included in that, right, um, have such little knowledge of these things. So what's the answer for 
the pastor today. Mm -hmm. If I'm presuming there will be a number of them who listen to this podcast. Well, I hope not, depending on what I say. (laughs) And uh, I mean, I'm thinking back to my own seminary experience. And I've studied numerous languages, you know, the the Greek, the Hebrew, the Latin, and the German and the French for the other studies. And we speak Portuguese in the home. Right. And yet the way you're describing it, Mm -hmm. their education makes me feel completely unequipped not only the languages right right because i have not read much at all of the corpus of mm-hmm. greek and roman philosophy right sad to say and and i'm 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 presuming they were exposed to those as well and read deeply into yes. calvin uh, calvin read as a uh, scott manich says in his book uh, calvin and the company of pastors calvin reread uh, the majority of cicero's corpus every year so he would read De Officiis uh, on duties. He would read De Natura Deorum, the nature of the gods, and uh, De Finibus Bonorum et Malorum, the limits of good and evil. He would read uh, primarily, I think, those three philosophical treatises um, each year. And the purpose was not only to enjoy, you know, the quality of style and thought, but to keep his Latin sharp, mm. so that when he wrote to, you know, kings and queens and dukes all over Europe. Uh, they would actually read what he wrote. And he would um, cover the Protestant Reformation as much as he was able uh, with glory and not shame uh, for the learning of the ministers. So what would you, or how would you advise a pastor today? Right. They can't go back to when they were eight and do it again. But Mm -hmm. should they start reading Cicero? Should they start learning Latin if they've never learned it? Yes, to both questions, but I think there's a more uh, systemic and, even though that word is much abused, uh, a, a, a more systemic and deeper approach that needs to be taken. Um, I, I think as I've thought about this, and my conclusions may not be accurate, but I think that generally um, men have, we as a, a pastorate perhaps, including myself, have perhaps less education than we ought to, is because these things are generally not valued um, mm-hmm. in the churches. And so um, the seminaries and the colleges and the universities that produce men for Christian ministry, I think they are primarily responding to what the churches value. If the church is valued a highly literate pastorate, then I think a highly literate pastorate um, would emerge. And um, I really don't want to give the impression that I am putting down my fellow uh, ministers um, in Christian service, because I believe that they are doing, by God's grace, very well and as well as they can. And I don't want to elevate the life of the mind above uh, the preaching of the gospel, because I don't think that's appropriate, right? We believe in the perspicuity of Scripture. It's clear. Um, an eighth grader, a sixth grader, a fourth grader, without any kind of special learning, can read the Scriptures or even just hear them preached and come to a saving knowledge of God. I don't want to give the impression that one has to have a lot of learning in order to be a faithful minister. And in fact, in the places that we're talking about, um, places like Basel and Geneva and Edinburgh and so forth, Strasbourg, um, sometimes uh, the leading lights of the Reformation that we've mentioned, Beza, Calvin, uh, Junius, and so forth, they would ordain men to gospel ministry who had very little education and send them out into the villages and um, parishes so that God's word would be readily available to the common people. And that's very important. But that's a separate question than what is the ideal kind of preparation for a minister, all things being equal, right? In hard times, with small resources, with persecution, and the kinds of things they faced, we maybe don't have the leisure to pursue the optimal kind of education. Mm. But if we do have those opportunities, then some men at least should be Uh, and some women should be strongly encouraged to get that kind of education rather than lowering the bar for everyone. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. I, and I think what you're saying makes sense for those considering entering the ministry, but let's take a different example of of someone who's been pastoring in various capacities, let's say for 15 years. Sure. They're far past seminary. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, So I'll play that part, right? So I say, 
okay, David, so if I start reading Cicero tomorrow, right. instead of spending an hour scrolling Twitter, uh -huh. which keeps me up to date with what's happening in the world, uh -huh. and there's value there, right? You're talking about the transient, ephemeral, uh, passing away world that will soon be purged <laughs> and consumed by fire, as Peter says. But Cicero, reading Cicero versus reading Elon Musk's tweets, right. I mean, there's value in both of them. There is some value in both of them, I grant that. <laughs> And I read some of Elon Musk's tweets. Well, so do I. And they're very entertaining. Yep. And I do actually get some benefit from Twitter okay. in terms of kind of a feeling of what's going on in the, around the world today. Mm -hmm. But um, And a lot of heartburn, right? I don't get heartburn from Twitter. You don't. But after about an hour, I'm like, I should probably do something else. Right. So if instead I cut my Twitter time in half or more and invested it in consciously in Cicero. I'm using Cicero just That's as fine. the example. He's a good example. What's the benefit to me? And is it kind of like, um, well, we talked earlier about lifting, working out. Okay. Okay. So when you first start working out, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. You can't lift very much weight. Right. And then six months later, you're feeling better. You're getting stronger. You can lift more weight. Your body has adapted to Your the body has stimulus. adapted and changed considering you're eating well and sleeping. Mm -hmm. And then a year after starting it, you're kind of, you've kind of gone through somewhat of a transformation. Sure. Is it the same with Cicero or is it like, how does Cicero change you? Right. Well, he's just an example. And I, of course I don't want to fasten on no, him no, too much if I and can. I'm just using him as an example. I understand. But yeah. let me answer the question in a little bit different way. Mm -hmm. If I can, um, I hear a lot of people express admiration for the accomplishments of the men of that generation right? The first wave of reformers, Luther, um, 1486, I think, to 1543, the second wave, Calvin, the third wave, uh, Beza, Knox, and so forth. I hear people express a lot of admiration for those men, but unfortunately, I don't hear much discussion of how it is that those men accomplished those things. Now, clearly, it was God's singular grace, but also it was because they trained and prepared in a certain way. So if we want to imitate and replicate some of their accomplishments, we have to read the things they read, and we have to behave the way they behaved. And so they read Augustine, and they read uh, Seneca and Cicero and John Chrysostom. Uh, so for example, Calvin, um, I think it was 1538, I might be a little bit late, but he has a cousin, uh, Pierre Leviton, who published the first French edition of the Bible. And Leviton asked Calvin, would you write the foreword to this? So Calvin wrote a Latin foreword to this Bible, and in it he named the five Greek fathers mm -hmm. that uh, evangelicals, Protestants, should primarily study, and the five Latin fathers. So that seems to me a good starting point for those who want to learn what the Reformed faith is. And so I would, I would like to see people reading a lot more Augustine and a lot less Bavink. Now someone might reply, well, you've created a false dichotomy. Why can't you read both? Okay, great. Read both. You might have to cut down on your Twitter time, but um, if you want to, if we want to uh, think the way they thought, at least to some extent, because we valorize them, right? Their portraits are hanging everywhere. They're on mugs. They're on T-shirts and so forth. How did they accomplish those things? By God's grace, but with a specific education. Um, Luther before fifteen seventeen. I guess in the first decade of that century, he read pretty much Augustine and the Bible, and that was it for almost 10 years. Uh, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but for sure those were his two primary influences. Mm. And so I could wish we would spend a lot more time um, with Augustine, mm. uh, as the men of those uh, generations did. But to get to Cicero, um, first of all, I, I'll quibble a little bit with the notion that one must read something only if it brings benefit, uh, because the benefit could just be enjoyment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why do you drink coffee? Why do you look at a sunset? Um, why do you enjoy a good meal? Why do I listen to music? I don't instrumentalize each one of those activities so that they bring me some pragmatic benefit. If someone says to me, how come you listen to, uh, Haydn is one of my favorite composers, why do you listen to Haydn? What does that do for you? I typically don't feel like I have to prove, here's the practical benefit of listening mm. to a Haydn concerto. I do it because I enjoy it. But when it comes to literature, 
suddenly we tend to instrumentalize it and say, well, I'm not going to do that if it doesn't bring some pragmatic benefit. Now, I'm not saying that's what you're doing with Cicero, but for sure that's what some people do. Why should I read X unless it gives me some um, practical result? I think that's the entirely wrong way to begin. Mm. But if we're going to look at it, well, in addition to the great enjoyment that Cicero brings, um, it helps you as a thinker. Um, it structures your thought. Like looking at a beautiful painting, right? It arguably sensitizes you to um, the beauties of God's creation. I think the emphasis on the practical, and this is revealing something in me right now, is kind of a, a phenomena that's quite prevalent in culture today. Yes. I mean, we have podcasts devoted to the benefit of walking in the morning and right. getting sunlight right. in your eyes, <clears throat> which, of course, there's physiological benefit to that. Mm -hmm. Or why you should jump into a freezing cold lake right. and sit there for a few minutes. Right. You know, because of the dopamine effect. Like, it's always like an if then, mm -hmm. cause and effect. Right. And so, yeah, you're exposing something in me too is. Mm -hmm. Well, why would I read Cicero versus Cormac McCarthy? Or mm -hmm. why would I choose this author versus that author? Now, I don't know the name Cormac McCarthy too well. I think he's an he's a Irish novelist? No, he's an American. Um, the Road. Okay. Um, Lonesome Dove. Okay. Kind of gritty, like Americana type stuff. Okay. No Country for, for Old Men. Oh, yeah. But, That's um, familiar. So you don't feel the need to justify reading that, do you? You read it because you enjoy it. Absolutely. Now, if you were to read it to the neglect of your family or other responsibilities, that would be uh, vicious, right? But nobody says, why, why are you reading that? What are you getting out of it? Hmm. Enjoyment, isn't that enough? That's how we make yeah. most of our decisions. Why do we wear certain kinds of clothing? It'd be much more convenient to go the Zuckerberg route, right? And wear the same drab thing every day to reduce your uh, anxiety of decision-making. But we don't do that. We like to wear colorful clothing and beautiful clothing, okay. making all these aesthetic choices. It's a hard sell today, though, isn't it? Yes, because we're all talk pragmatists. <laughs> no, 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 not only that, but talk to any person even in your church. Now, maybe, uh -huh. and we'll talk about your church in a minute, but talk to anyone in Grand Rapids. Just randomly walk up to anybody okay. and say, hey, would you rather watch the new whatever thing is on Netflix? Or, you know, here's here's a free copy of Augustine's Confessions. Right. Make a choice. Right. Why are most people going to choose Netflix? Because it's easier. It's easier, but also... they're passive recipients. It doesn't require as much of the mind. Good. So then that leads to the question, how do you cultivate um, a sense of enjoyment mm -hmm. in people for things that will ultimately... Well, I would say from an aesthetic standpoint, are actually more beautiful. I agree. And long-term will benefit them more if the Holy Spirit... Well, now we're doing the practical again. Well, but if, if there the is Holy... Here's, here's, the, here's the key. I believe the Holy Spirit um, can work through Augustine's confessions. I should be careful what I say. Can work through Augustine's confessions because a lot, much of it is scripture um, in a way that may bring more sanctification than watching Netflix. Is that... Play, is that put with enough caveats and provisos? To... Absolutely, but I guess. But to your question, how do you it, it first has it? to be taught really well. So it starts in. Someone has to present it in an appealing way, and it doesn't have to be an either or. I watch Netflix, right? I'm not advocating for you know the entire abandonment of anything that's contemporary or trivial. We all need some trivial release from the hard work of the mind. My complaint is that there's not really much effort given to the hard work of the mind. Mm. It's primarily all the other thing. And among Christians, that's too bad. Mm. Um, we will all be impoverished if there aren't some persons in the Christian community who pursue the life of the mind very rigorously and strenuously mm -hmm. so that they can understand and explain things to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned uh, my professor, John Hare, right? I have read very little Kant in my life just the things I was assigned to read in my philosophy courses. But he has read a lot of Kant. He is an expert in Kant. So he can bring to the Christian community whatever valuable things there may be 
in the work of Immanuel Kant. Uh, and I'm not arguing for Kant, it's just an example. Um, similarly, Augustine, right? Um, someone has to, um, I would say, read and know those things for the benefit of the Christian community, or everyone is impoverished. And I'm not saying everyone has to read those things, but we should have a genuine respect and um, delight in uh, that kind of pursuit and encourage persons who have the capacity to go for something like that. Mm. Mm-hmm. I feel like the end of my answer here is wandering a little bit. So no, no, no. You as a capable it's... interviewer can tease it out. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, the capable part, but okay. uh, I am asking you questions. And that's actually a good segue to talk about your church because okay. we, we've been, t- well, at least you were just saying that Christians, sh- we should be known f- for, well, let me use my own words, okay. for those pursuing beauty in its best forms. Right. So not that we're known as those who reject Netflix or reject watching videos on YouTube right. or Twitter, but um, as those who also, or even more than that, pursue beauty in its better forms. Such, mm. And a lot of that, I would say, is in the things we choose to read. Okay. Um, the types type of music we enjoy. Uh, or participate in. Mm -hmm. So, but I guess the question is for, for those who have been charged with leading the church, the shepherds, all right, how can they, how do you cultivate that kind of a, an atmosphere of the pursuit of beauty Mm. amongst your own congregants? So I'm going to draw some distinctions here and, and maybe I say a few things different than what you said. Because um, we got to this question, uh, as I remember, based on what ought uh, ministers to pursue in terms of their education by comparison to the men of the past, specifically the 16th century, the reformers. And I think that's a really important question, and most of my previous comments were in response to that. If we move now to the question about church life and the reading and aesthetic habits of individual church members, I'm going to give a much different answer. So I don't think necessarily that um, church members ought to be known in their secular callings, in non-Christian settings. I don't think they should be known primarily for their pursuit of beauty, unless we want to say that uh, beauty is Christ, uh, which he is. I think that um, what we as a church ought to be known for is our devotion to Christ, our Savior, our willingness to suffer for his sake, our um, commitment to the glories of the next life, that we are pilgrims and sojourners, and uh, we are members of the church militant, uh, and we fight with the weapons of peace and love, not the weapons of the world, and we are not members of the church triumphant until the next life. Mm. So what this means is that for the members of my congregation, I don't have a desire to move them toward reading you know, great Christian literature of the past, Um, My goals are very different. I want to simply proclaim to them um, the Word of God and administer the sacraments to them as He enables me and um, pray that the Holy Spirit will bring them into union with Christ and lead lives of, you know, fruitful sanctification and productivity. Mm. Um, Productivity meaning, you know, useful to the kingdom of God, uh, love of God and their neighbor. Now, if they ask me questions, right... Pastor, what do you think I should read? Should I should I spend three hours watching Netflix, or should I try to read a couple pages of Augustine? Well, that's a very different sort of thing. But you know, my my role and purpose as a minister is not to shape their aesthetic habits. And the only beauty, the only love of beauty that I would like to inculcate in them, uh, catechize in them, is the love of uh, the beauty of Christ as He's revealed in the page. And I think that's an important distinction uh, because it's a very different question for ministers, training seminary students, um, and so forth, because then we're talking about what are the tools they need um, to do their job best. Mm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So then I would restate what I said earlier based on what you just said in that the nurturing of 
are of the congregation's right. pursuit of beauty would be a capital B beauty mm -hmm. in the sense that Christ alone is that beauty right. wh whom we pursue right and who is the personification and, right. ma and manifestation of our capital H yes. hope yes um, and that and, has lots of implications yeah. for the kinds of decisions we make about the media yes. we consume and the way we lead our lives. Mm -hmm. But I am not interested in getting involved in congregants' aesthetic decisions, except insofar as um, it bears directly on that question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not a desire to cultivate you know, an elitist idea that uh, members of a Christian church you know, should be classicists. I think that's silly, frankly. I have no desire to pursue that. Mm. However, um, the preaching of God's word and the sacraments and prayer will mature us in grace. And so we will say, learn to say no, God willing, um, to the filthy things of the world and, and yes to um, righteousness. And that means that some things we won't watch, some things we won't read, um, some places we won't go, uh, but we will seek to glorify God in whatever calling, you know, uh, we're placed. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that our callings are very different. Yeah. What's your level of familiarity with the preaching of, say, Beza, Calvin, and, and other, mm -hmm. Luther? Right. And these others of the Reformation that we've been talking about? Because I have a question for you. Yeah. Well, I've, I've read a lot about it. I don't claim it's special expertise. And no doubt there are some questions you could ask me I wouldn't know the answer to, but I'll be careful to say only what I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be. And let me kind of bring these, these threads together a bit is uh -huh. that we've been talking about. So we've been, we've been discussing the, um, the educational foundation of the reformers, which was coupled with a God-given genius, mm -hmm. brilliance, and according to his sovereign will and uh -huh. grace at this particular time in history. Um, we're at a very different time in history now. Right. And from my own experience, let's say over the past decade, mm -hmm. both in England and here and back in the United States now, um, I've been, I guess the word for it would be disappointed hmm. in the way preaching is done. Hmm. And my question to you is, would an emphasis on, on the one hand for the, those younger going into the ministry, would an emphasis on a more rigorous, to use your word, mm -hmm. rigorous, classical, philosophical underpinning, mm -hmm for the younger ones, but also for those already in ministry, how would that po potentially change the way that preaching is done okay. in the church today? Right. Now, I'm going to tread very lightly here. Because and I don't want you to offend anyone, but I, I, <laughs> I would rather say to those listening, <laughs> this is for the sake of very constructive, okay. compassionate critique. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'll tread lightly. I have only been ordained for... Um, three years. I've preached for a long time, mm -hmm. um, but I'm by no means an expert. So how would such training potentially enable men to preach better? Um, Where could our preaching get right. to in the future? Right. Well, I think that the most important thing, as I understand it, is we have to understand what are the purposes of preaching, right? What is preaching supposed to accomplish? What is its end or its goal? And my own thinking on this has changed a lot over the years as God has okay. given me opportunities to preach. Um, the very popular author, Eugene Peterson, once described preaching as 30 minutes to raise the dead, mm -hmm. right? That's a catchy. And I thought about it for many years. And because I was studying classical rhetoric, I was studying Cicero, Demosthenes, Isaias, Lysias, all these guys. There's a very standard and formulaic way to construct any kind of public exhortation. There are canons of oratory. It's, a, it's a, um, an algorithm, kind of, that you can plug any topic into, and if you know the forms, it spits out a speech. So I thought, well, if preaching is 30 minutes to raise the dead, then my goal is to give a, um, a, a powerful oratorical performance that will excite and drive people toward Christ. 
Mm. And um, I became convinced that that's entirely wrong. Okay. And um, because of Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians, I desired to know um, Christ and him crucified and to, to proclaim only Christ. I think in 1 Corinthians, and here I'm relying on the work of a man named A. Dwayne Litvin, um, Paul is deliberately rejecting and renouncing the forms of Greco-Roman oratory for Christian preaching. Now, since the time of Paul, and including especially in the 16th century, many uh, men used the forms of classical oratory as training wheels to learn how to preach. And so I think it still has value. But the goals of Christian preaching are so different than the goals of classical oratory that I think it has those, those tools have limited value. So to be more specific. Yeah, can you articulate that difference yes. in particular? Right. So the goals of classical oratory are to push people toward certain ends, to get them to do things primarily. And anything is fair game in terms of uh, the methods you use to get them to do something. So if it's deliberative oratory, then you're trying to persuade them to adopt uh, position X or to reject position Y. If it's um, forensic oratory of the courtroom, then you're trying to convince them that so-and-so is guilty or innocent. And if it's what's called epideictic oratory, display oratory, you're trying to heap praise on someone or heap blame on someone else. So that's a, a very thumbnail sketch of classical oratory. And it's, it's summarized in uh, this phrase. This is from Cicero and Quintilian, that the purpose of communication is to teach, um, to persuade, and to entertain or delight, right? So I think that that's of limited value for a Christian preacher because I believe that the purpose of a Christian preacher is to present Christ to his congregation and also to himself, which is why Augustine, when he enters the pulpit to preach, he always includes himself in the description of what he's about to do. Mm. And he says, as the bread of life is broken before us, as we sit under the word of God. An orator, a classical orator, would never take that kind of approach. The classical orator is always seeking to control the audience in some way. Now, it could be a good way, right? There, there are good ends, or it could be a bad way, but the goal is always control. The minister is not trying to do that with the congregation. And this should be a great check on his pride, I think. The goal is to present Christ and to trust the Holy Spirit um, to, to do his work based on the presentation of Christ in the Word. Uh, and so, for example, I was just reading a few weeks ago, um, Heinrich Bullinger, who was Zwingli's successor uh, in Zurich, he took that, that threefold um, classical uh, diagram of communication, docere delectara moere, to teach, to gratify, to persuade. And he said, it's not like that. It's docere hortari consolari, which means to teach, to exhort toward the truth, and to comfort, mm. right? So comfort is not an aspect of classical oratory, but in some ways comfort is essential to what a Christian preacher does. Uh, he stands before uh, men and women, boys and girls, as a fallible, weak, sinful person, holding forth to them the comfort of God's word and holding forth to himself at the same time. And so as I have thought about preaching, and I'm by no means uh, an expert or even a good preacher, the, the goal is to present Christ, and um, I think therefore clarity and fidelity are the twin goals. I want to present Christ as clearly as I can without any um, of my own nonsense getting in the way, you know, my own pride or uh, anything else that would detract from, from Christ. I don't live up to that by any stretch, but it's the goal nonetheless. And then fidelity to the text. What does the text say about Christ, whether it's Isaiah or Matthew um, or any other passage? And that needs to be presented. And so the notion of trying to do something in 30 minutes to get a response, um, which I previously believed was the proper goal of preaching, I don't hold that anymore. And it's honestly very freeing um, mm -hmm. to have much more modest goals for preaching. I mean, you still want to do well, 
but you redefine well as meaning, have I presented Christ faithfully and with clarity? And um, trust the Holy Spirit for the rest. When you say the burden's been alleviated, is that also lessened? Part- yeah. Lessened. Yeah. Okay. That's- <laughs> it's still there because <laughs> we're all still human. Would you, would you, would you say that that has also to do with the fact that you recognize it's not in your power as, as much as perhaps the, uh, the threefold, right. mm-hmm. um, the, the three algorithms would right, place, right. so they would place the burden of, uh, the burden of effectiveness right. on the orator. Right. Yes, the entire outcome. you still outcome. have the responsibility. Right. The enti- you're, you're exactly right. The entire outcome, the success or failure of the classical orator depends entirely on what he does. Right? If he's very good, he persuades people. If he's very poor, he doesn't. A Christian preaching is not like that. Right? Um, people come to saving faith in Christ even when an unbeliever preaches to them hmm. because of the work of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus sent out the twelve... You know Judas was a part of that entourage, and Judas turned out to be an unbeliever. No doubt some people came to true and saving faith under Judas's preaching, right? Or the many other individuals in the New Testament who apostatized, right? And, and throughout history, ministers leave the faith and prove themselves unbelievers. Mm. People still come to true and saving faith under their ministry because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. This is not an argument for being an unbeliever or doing your work poorly, obviously, but it's an argument for recognizing that the outcome of our work as preachers is the Holy Spirit's responsibility. Yeah. I've never asked this of anyone, but the... Oh, boy. (laughs) Are you conscious of the Holy Spirit, not in a weird kind of Pentecostal way, but are you conscious of the Holy Spirit working in the in the very in the actual act of preaching not that you see visions or right. you see things but just it's it's on your mind it like is on my like mind there's an all awareness the time. it is on my mind but perceiving something happening i don't know about no that. it's not perceiving it's just being consciously consciously acknowledging the fact while you're preaching that almost in a way of reminding yourself it's him it's his work he's doing the work you know, as you're... Yes, I seek to remind myself of that constantly. And our worship is structured in such a way that we have a prayer for illumination, as I imagine most all Reformed churches do. That mm-hmm. is, before the word is preached, we consciously plead, and we explicitly and, and verbally plead with the Holy Spirit to illuminate his word and to um, make it effectual to the conversion of sinners, you know, to the comfort of the saints, uh, to the sanctification of the saints. So in the act of preaching... Um, yes, I'm, I'm conscious of that. Mm-hmm. J. Gresson Machen, his, um, I don't really know what he meant, but I thought about it a lot, and I think there's something helpful in it. His advice to preachers was, um, if you get in the pulpit and you don't know what to do, just roar. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not sure what he means, but what I think he means is stay at it with as much intensity as God enables you and stop thinking about yourself and worrying about it. I think that's what that means. And Augustine's advice is, if you get into the pulpit and you don't know what to say, read the scriptures, mm. because they're more eloquent than you will ever be. Mm. Don't, don't try to be fancy and novel. There, there's too much of that. Just stick to God's word. What now, about, I'm making myself sound more pious than I am. And no, I'm about that's to cut, not you, my I'm goal, about to cut you down. Please do. Yeah. So what about after when, on the one hand, you know, there's two things that could happen. Right. The two extremes, that is. One is despair. Ah, oh, that was horrible. I can't believe I said that, or I didn't say this, or I mm-hmm. just, that was horrible. Or on the other hand, like, that was pretty good. Right. Like, I'm getting good at this. Yeah. How do you deal with those two extremes? Um, as someone who, by your own confession, has preached much many and times yet ordained recently right yeah there's a lot of stories and anecdotes that i've collected from different people in different times and um i still don't know what to make of it uh luther 
you know, there's a story of Luther where he got out of the pulpit and a woman came up to him and said, that was wonderful, Dr. Luther. Did you know, do you know what a wonderful sermon that was? And he said, yes, because uh, the devil has been telling me that every minute since I stepped down from the pulpit. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's the times when you don't know if it has any effect, mm. right? Um, but this was the same for Christ, and this was the same for the apostles. So I guess it's part of the job. Um, Christ preaches, and half the half the crowd leaves him. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, you read Second Timothy four, and uh, Paul's very faithful ministry, and yet several people. Um, in fact, the whole the whole Church of Rome didn't show up for his defense. And uh, at his first defense, he said, "You know, everyone abandoned me, but the Spirit was with me." And I, I escaped the um, the lion's jaws. And there's particular individuals who abandon him in his moment of need. Um, so I don't really know. I do know that the Lord disciplines everyone whom he accepts as a son, uh, which means if a person, if a man has a true calling as a, as a minister of the gospel, the Holy Spirit will accomplish with him what he desires uh, through suffering and failure and weakness. Um, that's that's all I would have to say. Has it been, or was it hard for you to go from full time teaching to then preaching? Because we just talked about the right. three algorithms, and I'm assuming that you may have relied upon one or three of those in your pedagogical. Oh yeah. Context. Right. Well, preaching is pedagogical in a way too. Sure. However. They're very different. They're very different. So I have no, I have no problem. But I mean, has it? I, I would say, right. kind of existentially for right. you, has it been? Has that been difficult? You, your identity, apart from okay, my identity These is in are Christ. Really personal questions, aren't they? Well, you, you, uh, you volunteered to come <laughs> here, buddy. <laughs> yes, it has been difficult. But if I can I, answer There's the, a background to this, ahead. because when you and I had coffee at mm-hmm. Stovetop about a year ago, right, and you were, you hadn't yet, had you accepted the pastorate yet? No. You hadn't, no, I was, right? I was, I was you were serving as place. an interim pastor. That's right. And right. there was this big question in your mind. And at the time, I got the impression, mm-hmm. whether you said it or not, that there was a sense of loss and lament, because you were leaving... This the profession, the thing you had done for so long, and you were obviously very good at it. Um, I mean, are you okay talking about those circumstances and and that transition? In a limited, think, in a limited sense, help. in a limited sense, yes. I'm only asking you because I think it would help help some people. Okay, listening. <clears throat> well. Um, let me start with the technical aspect. You know, the docere delectara moera teach, gratify, and persuade. Um, in the classroom, as long as it's not an exercise in utter vanity, which sometimes it is, I have no problem with trying to entertain the audience, right? Try to make the students laugh and try to make it interesting and clown around and goof off and so forth. So uh, Machen, when he was in the classroom teaching Greek, he used to walk around with books uh, on the top of his head as he strolled through the classroom to try to balance. And the goal was to make the students laugh and um, disarm them, right? There's a story of um, Cornelius Van Til throwing chalk at his students. And I had a professor, Mark Talbot, he's at Wheaton now, throw a piece of chalk at me in a philosophy class because I was asking him too many pointed questions. So the way you behave in the classroom I think can follow that classical model to a T and it's very effective. I had a Greek professor who would uh, frisbee his ID card at us right. when we misidentified right. certain conjugations. That's good. That's good. And I like to tease and, you know, um, gently humiliate and then also lavishly praise students in the classroom. I don't think any of that is appropriate from the pulpit, right? Because no? I don't think I don't think that the goal is to entertain the audience, except in so the, the congregation, see, I, it's hard to even use the right terms, except as insofar as you can hopefully, by the Spirit's power, teach them to find Christ gratifying. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a difficulty, right? You have to switch gears. And so in some of my other 
projects, you know, like the podcast and so forth, where I try to be goofy, right? People might naturally assume that that's how one would behave in other settings, mm. but that would be a wrong assumption because preaching is a sacred and holy thing, and the other kinds of things I do are not. So there's a, a difference. To your other question, is it a difficult transition? I don't think it's probably any harder than anyone else's career transitioned from one thing to the next. And by God's grace, I have a very loving and supportive and godly congregation that has made this uh, easy. And I still get to do a lot of the things that I enjoyed before. I have this nice appointment at Puritan Seminary, and I have online teaching in Greek and Latin. So God is very gracious to me, and uh, that's more than enough to compensate for you know, um, late forties, early fifties career shifting. Mm. So, okay. No, thanks for being honest about that. Um, you mentioned your podcast just now. I've, I've listened to a number of episodes. All of them? No, no. Okay. There are other podcasts I listen to as well. Mm -hmm. And we already talked about my Twitter time. Right, yeah. right. Talk to me about the podcast. I'd like to get more people listening to your podcast. No, I agree with that goal. Hopefully this will help. <laughs> <laughs> they might be surprised. I don't know. It's very different than the kind of conversation we've been having. It's very different. In because fact, it's the not... banter. I would call it a friendly, classical banter. Okay. It's very entertaining. Mm, good. Um, its and... goal is not um, proselytizing, though. No, not at all. It, it, it seems like its goal is to get people. I, you used a very interesting term just just a minute ago about uh, comedy in the classroom. Mm -hmm. you, you said disarm the students, right? And I thought that was brilliant because um, that is essentially what you're trying to do, isn't it? Yes, is to make them drop their guard to stop them from thinking about themselves and how they appear to one another and to the teacher, mm. and to get them to think about the content. Mm -hmm. And that is the most difficult, and I would say probably the most important part of teaching. Well, I thought when I, before I had listened to your podcast, mm -hmm. I thought this is going to be well, perhaps dry. Yeah, two guys kind talking of an NPR about... vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of an NPR vibe, or just something maybe like uh, I'll listen to it because I met him. Right, that and was kind of you. And then I thought, this is actually quite entertaining. Thank you. Um, and it's, it was definitely not what I expected, yeah. which is this back and forth banter, mm -hmm. but about a topic that for a lot of people, and this is going back to our discussion about beauty, mm -hmm. to a lot of people is, are things that are ancient, old, and not as shiny and right. attractive as uh, what's on these little black screens that we have. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the podcast. Right. Well, what would you like to know? Do you have I want to know how it question? started. That's really one of my main questions okay. is, was this, um, was this a way to kind of compensate? That's a very negative term, but to compensate for what was happening during this transition? Or no. did it start before that? It started before. Okay. So um, it was the summer of 2020, right? We were coming out of COVID. So this was a COVID project? No, we were coming out of COVID. We were not in or going into COVID. The summer of 2020. Yeah. I'm just quibbling. That's what I do uh, successfully. And I had these online courses, my Greek and Latin courses that I was teaching online while an employee at Calvin University with their blessing and to some extent their support. Is this the Latin per diem? Yes, the Latin per diem and Moss Method, which is my Greek course. Let's talk about that as well in a minute. But Great. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was just doing some study and research, and one of the things that I read said that um, a good way to promote such enterprises is to have a podcast. And um, I read a lot. I don't think I read very fast and probably not as much as other people, but I really enjoy the life of the mind, and I read interesting things. And I thought maybe the interesting things that I read could be of value to other people. So I cast around for a co-host unsuccessfully, and then my daughter said, why don't you have Jeff Winkle? Uh, be your co-host. Um, you guys get along really well. And Jeff and I are very different, but we were colleagues together at Calvin for many years. He's also an alumnus of that institution. And we had traveled together. And um, our Greek guide, Christiana uh, Dimitra, says there's two ways to know a person. 
travel with them and play games with them. So mm. if you travel with them and you play a game, their true character is revealed. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. So I called up Jeff and I said, would you like to do a podcast? And he said, would I? And so then we, we started. And then I asked my son, uh, Freddie, I said, you know, you listen to a lot of podcasts. What should a podcast be like? And he said, well, dad, you like to lecture. And it should definitely not be that. <laughs> he said, the best podcasts are ones where there are two friends who like the same thing. And then the audience is invited to listen in as they discuss something that they both thoroughly and sincerely enjoy. Mm. And so then Jeff and I got started and um, we're still going. So that's the genesis of it. Were your, um, were those, were, were those pieces of advice about travel and games? Did mm -hmm. they, did they prove out? Yes. Okay. Yes. Jeff and I have a very good relationship because we, in, we know each other in a way that, you know, can be hard uh, to know someone if you haven't traveled with them, lived with them in some sense. And uh, he and I are very different. Our interests are also different. He's much more interested in pop culture than I am. He's much more knowledgeable in all of those things than I am. But he's not disinterested in or um, ignorant of classical things, obviously, because he has, you know, an advanced degree in classics. So we play off each other well, I think. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Have you gotten much um, feedback from people about the podcast? Well, you told me earlier that you like it. Well, I'm so. just one person. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we have a, an inter a small international audience. Okay. And uh, we just released today episode 122. And we have been able to um, interview some of our own intellectual heroes. We interviewed Gary Schmidt, who is a, a writer of children's books, a fantastic writer, a former Calvin colleague. Um, we interviewed Dr. Ken Bratt, who was our a professor at Calvin. Um, a man named Ed Watts, who is uh, an expert in Roman history. We just uh, were able to interview a woman named uh, Marguerite Fox, who wrote obituaries for the New York Times for 20-some years and uh, is a, a writer of narrative nonfiction um, on the, uh, the cracking of the Linear B code, which was discovered on Crete. Um, a famous man, oh, can I remember his name? Ross King. Uh, we interviewed Ross King, who writes these books on art history. Um, the Pope's Ceiling, about the Sistine Chapel. He wrote uh, Leonardo da Vinci and the Last Supper. And so we got to talk to these people. So this is like a dream come true, right? I get to read these fascinating books and then talk to the people who wrote them. And uh, people seem to like it. So we're very pleased. Do you feel that through this you are helping to cultivate a life of the mind internationally amongst people that maybe will have benefited from the prodding in a sense? I hope your, so. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Uh, try to yeah. be modest in my goals like that. Yeah. I think so. That's, that's the desire. Um, people, uh, if we're going to learn things that are unfamiliar, they need to be taught. Right. And I don't presume to be a teacher for those who don't want to be taught, but if you listen to the podcast, right, you're signing up to learn something at least to some extent. Mm. And uh, we try to teach in a very lighthearted way so that it's more appealing. Another really nice feature of it is that uh, Jeff and I are both um, Christians, you know, professing Christians, yet that's not the focus of the show. The focus of the show is whatever classical topic we're interested in. But I think that we are never hesitant to um, discuss how this intersects or in some cases does not, uh, with our Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So around the time of Christmas, um, we did an episode on the census of Quirinius in uh, Luke chapter 2. And um, that was a very fun episode to do, and I think it was useful to people. There's quite a bit of controversy over that um, particular census. So we surveyed the literature, presented it. So that's what you would call an ostensibly Christian topic. Um, but we did one on... Um, pop music, which, you know, Jeff's very fond of and, and talked about that. So it's my conviction that if, if you want to make um, some aspects of the Christian faith appealing, I have to be careful how I put this, um, you just have to present it in a natural way mm -hmm. rather than seeking. So the goal of each episode uh, is not to convert anyone to our way of thinking. It's just to talk about the things we like. Mm -hmm. But I think that's helped us to garner a more ecumenical, a much broader um, audience 
than if we had done a, quote, Christian podcast. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm curious to know how much prep time you and Jeff put into these podcasts, or is it just kind of ad hoc? Sometimes a lot, sometimes very little. Okay. Yeah. Probably depends on the yes. subject matter. So for yesterday's, uh, the, the episode that was released today <laughs> and recorded last week, we both read the book, right? Uh, I read it this spring. Jeff read it a few years ago that uh, Ms. Fox had written, um, The Riddle of the Labyrinth. So, I mean, however long it takes to read a book, six, seven, eight hours, right? That's, that's prep time. Um, we have a form that we use for the podcast, you know, a, a set skeleton each time we plug things in. Uh, but he and I have been teaching these subjects for um, almost 30 years. So I have lectured on classical mythology dozens of times. I can often just take my notes from a given lecture and plug it right into the podcast format. And then what we're adding is just the banter and, you know, contemporary stuff. Mm -hmm. Other episodes take a lot more work because they're more intricate. Yeah. Let me ask you about Latin per diem. Mm -hmm. So this is an online teaching right. uh, portal. Yes. So this was started in September of 2015. A man named Michael Lynch, a friend of mine who teaches out in New Jersey. He said, hey, there's this guy who's doing daily Greek lessons. Uh, you should do the same thing with Latin. I said, oh, that's an interesting suggestion. Thanks, Michael. So I started doing it. And so I got a tablet and I began recording little four or five minute uh, lessons of myself analyzing using a pen and a, you know, a stylus and a tablet um, some authentic piece of classical literature. And then I released these on YouTube. Um, and so I divided it up into three eras. So there's the classical era, there is uh, late antiquity and the medieval period, then there's Reformation, Renaissance, and after. And I just cycle through. So I do a set of mm. 10 lessons from the classics, 10 lessons from the second period, and 10 lessons from Reformation, post-Reformation, and um, Renaissance. And um, I've been doing that since 2015, so I have a large number of those free lessons I think uh, a little over 1,900 of those. Wow. And, and this is every day? Well, it was every day until probably 2021, with the exception of Sunday. Yeah. Um, since 2021, I've slowed down a little bit. Okay. And I release two to three a week. And I have a, a MailChimp subscription where people receive them in their inbox. Mm -hmm. I haven't released one in a couple of weeks because I'm too busy and I, I feel bad about that. But um, the backlog, the archive of material is significant. And I've improved in terms of the, you know, um, using the medium. So when I began, you know, I'm parsing every word. I'm explaining to people grammatical forms, how to translate. Um, when I began, it was very slow and stilted. I've learned now how to impart more information more succinctly. Um, and one thing that I'm really pleased about that project is that, again, um, I cover all eras and all kinds of authors. If I had started out by simply covering Christian authors, I might have gotten a much larger initial audience. Mm. But because I cover everything from Spinoza uh, to Descartes, um, Seneca, Augustine, Bonaventure, Chrysostom, um, all these different authors, Greek and Latin, it's, it's got very wide appeal. So I have, I have many viewers who are uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Jewish, um, some Islamic viewers, um, many of no religious affiliation. And to me, that's, you know, that's very gratifying because I'm, I'm reaching a large audience mm -hmm. uh, with that. Now, by large, I don't mean really large, right? Uh, if Taylor Swift buys a sandwich, right, that's like 30 million views, right? And uh, mine are much, much smaller. But still, for what I do, I'm pleased. Considering the subject matter. Correct. Um, but you also do translation work mm -hmm. and is that, you, you just mentioned that you're quite busy. Mm -hmm. Is that a reason for some of the busyness or are these, do you have some ongoing projects, um, such as the Calvin and Owen stuff that I saw right. you've been working on? How, what's that aspect of your workload look like? Uh, well, I don't know how to answer that exactly, but um, I can give a shout out to Jonathan Beakey, right, who's the academic dean at Puritan. In 2012, I think, he said, you know, David, there's this guy, Franciscus Junius, and uh, much of his work has never been translated. You should think about doing this. Uh, 
So you can see how, uh, how susceptible I am to suggestions. And so I said, all right, I'll give it a go. And I needed a book to get tenure at Calvin. So I translated Junius and I enjoyed it and it didn't come too difficult for me. And then after that, um, I translated some Beza, then a Calvin work, then William Perkins. Um, and then for InterVarsity, I've translated a number of snippets of different authors uh, for their Reformed, um, what is it, the Re Reformed Commentary on Scripture series. And uh, it's interesting that my, my work for Latin Per Diem, where each day I'm disciplining myself to analyze and present a small paragraph or a few sentences, has greatly improved my own Latin ability, mm. which I've then used, hopefully, in, in the service of these translations. Mm -hmm. um, so I recently finished something on John Aerosmith, which will be out soon from RHB, I hope. Uh, and I finished something from Samuel Rutherford. And um, so the interesting thing is that there's, there's massive amounts of Protestant erudition from the 16th and 17th centuries that is locked up in Latin, right? In the old days, if you were interested in that stuff, you could read Latin. So the interest was generally low, but the ability was generally high. Now it's the opposite problem. Now there's a lot of interest among Protestants in that kind of uh, work from our Protestant forebears, but the ability is generally low in terms of Latin. So this creates an opportunity for me to translate these things and present them. In terms of workload, um, I just try to segment the day up and, uh, you know, work when I have time. Yeah, that was, that was where my next question was going to go is you, you seem, you're, you're a guy who has a lot of balls in the air, as we say, a lot of things that you're doing. Um, is it frustrating for you th that, well, perhaps there's not enough hours in the day. I mean, for example, it seems like you had a pretty good streak going for Latin per diem, mm -hmm. and now you've... You're going to pile on? Is that what you're going to do, Tavis? <laughs> well, you're. I mean, it's impressive. Uh, but actually, the question I have for you is, where is, this all, where is this all heading? Oh, to the grave eventually. I of course it is. Of course it is. But where, I don't know. Where do you see this all... Where ideally would do you see this all heading is will there be a point where maybe you can shed some things and huh. just be pastor david or or perhaps there's a point where it's like i can just focus on doing my podcast or mm. or maybe it will be hey there's this resurgence this is me thinking totally spontaneous right. off the top of my head but there's a resurgence of interest in latin to the point right. <clears throat> that you start a latin a spoken Latin only podcast mm -hmm. and it has 10 million viewers. That, Joe Rogan is the co-host. Well, you would beat him <laughs> in the Spotify charts and <laughs> yeah, you could have him on. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Is it um, too much right now? No, no. I have a talented, um, godly and self-sacrificing wife mm. who does an amazing amount of work. And not only would it be selfish and stupid of me not to mention her, it would be dishonest. Mm -hmm. um, she um, makes all of my work much easier and more enjoyable because she's just very, she's just very gifted and, and very devoted. And I've uh, benefited a lot from my children too and the ways that they've helped me, mm -hmm. as well as the many other people, you know, um, who've helped me in, in a lot of different ways. I have help with Latin per diem. I, obviously, Jeff is the you know, co-host for the podcast. Um, just so many of the things that by God's grace I'm able to do, it's because I'm uh, next to uh, talented people, sometimes people far more talented, like uh, Chad Van Dixhorn, you know, who guided me through the, um, the Aerosmith project. Um, in terms of long-term goals, um, one thing I have that's kind of a, a pipe dream, so if there's some really um, well-heeled philanthropist that's listening and they want to do something, uh, in Rome right now, there's something called the Vivarium Novum, um, which is a spoken Latin school founded by a man named uh, Luigi Miralia. He founded it in Naples. I've had the, the privilege of meeting him a couple times. Now, he, uh, he's a world-class humanist. He, he makes me look like you know, a dunderhead by comparison, but he's, he's phenomenal. He's really brilliant. And this international school attracts uh, mostly young men, but also women from around the world to come and study Greek and Latin with him. 
Uh, God has blessed me to know some of the best classicists in America as personal friends. And I think there should be a vivarium uh, Americanum, right? A similar kind of place where uh, people can come and study Greek and Latin at a high level and gain real um, fluency and ability. Now, I wouldn't be the only teacher there, and I wouldn't necessarily be um, the best because there are others that are far better than I. Um, but maybe in my retirement, you know, that's something that that would be worth doing. Mm -hmm. And it would serve the church, God willing, and it would serve uh, the academy as well. Mm. But I don't want to present that as in conflict with my calling now, which is as a minister of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And um, I am, I'm blessed to be able to pastor this church and to have a session that is elders who uh, support me in doing these other kinds of things, mm. um, which also are very gratifying. Yeah. Are you happy where you've, I know the answer. Are you happy where you've ended up? I, I'm going to assume there was a, I don't point. like happiness questions. No, let's, let's, okay, forget <laughs> I said that. You, I'm assuming, had anticipated being a professor at Calvin or elsewhere uh -huh. for perhaps longer than you were. That's a good question. Where you are at now is quite a variegated existence. Mm -hmm. And without this singular focus on... That's true. You know, Professor Noe. Right. My focus has never been singular, but you're definitely right that I did not expect. You know, my my life, my story is is um, probably a lot like other people's. Things change. You have to take different, you have to take different um, approaches, different tracks, different opportunities. Uh, when I was very young, I was trying to decide between being a minister and being a professor. I went the professor route, and uh, a few decades later, um, God moved me into being a pastor, at least that's how it seems. I don't presume on his providence, you know, and he, he can change things anytime he wants to, obviously. Um, but I'm very content to be able to do the things that I do mm. by God's grace. Mm. Mm -hmm. And who knows what the, you know, what the future holds. Well, the immediate future for you is preaching at a funeral. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm very grateful that you came by. I know we had to change the schedule up a bit because of the, uh, well, the funeral and some other things, mm -hmm. but um, this is good. I'd love to have you back in because I want to probe deeper mm -hmm. and um, uh, speak about things that we didn't talk about, like your love of chess mm -hmm. and uh, maybe dive into your family a bit more. But in the interim, um, where can people find you? We've already touched on some of these, but I'd love to hear it now. So people, and we'll put it in the description as well. Okay, but, great. Yeah. Well, um, the majority of my work, you can go to latinperdm.com or you can go to the YouTube channel and there you can find all of the Latin lessons. Um, there are many of them, as I mentioned, a lot of Greek lessons too, where I analyze, um, authors like Xenophon and Sophocles and Homer, as well as the church fathers. I'm a great fan of John Chrysostom, um, would have liked to talk more about him uh, because he was a, a naturally gifted orator who honored Christ, you know, using his extraordinary brilliance as a speaker mm. um, in a way that kind of, I would say, brought the two worlds together, um, almost unique in that respect. Anyway, latinperdm.com. Um, I teach Greek at mossmethod.com, um, named after the author of the textbook, Charles Melville Moss. It's a 19th century textbook. Um, you can visit Reformation OPC if you are in Grand Rapids. Um, it is a godly church by God's grace, loving people, friendly people. Uh, we're just a humble, you know, little congregation, but uh, the Lord has brought us together uh, and knit us together as a body. Um, you can check out the podcast ad nauseum.com. There's a V in that because the, the more natural spelling was already taken. So don't go to that website. Uh, that's kind of unpleasant, but go to this one, <laughs> A-D-N-A-V-S-E-A-M, and you can listen to the podcast if you want to. Okay. We'll have that in the description. Mm -hmm. And on Chris Austin, which right. we'll talk about more next time, I'm being conscious of the time for you. I appreciate that. Is, um, yeah, I think I started the practice, so I finished seminary in 2013. Mm. After the invention of the automobile. Yes. Okay. And... 
uh, I think it was in my last year of seminary. I st- perhaps it was one of the professor's recommendations, but I I would make sure that whatever text I was preaching on, mm-hmm. I would go see what did Chrysostom mm-hmm. do or say. Yeah, I think that's wise. And it usually, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's always a humbling experience. Mm-hmm. And I think, how in the world could I preach something like that? Right. But there's little nuggets and snippets and things right. that um, that I've always found very, very helpful. Right. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, as uncomfortable as it sometimes was, <laughs> to talk about myself. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about yourself more. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.